Hi, I'm Claire. And I'm Helena, and we both work at the MS Trust. Just a little disclaimer, we are recording this over Zoom because of coronavirus and social distancing. So apologies if it sounds a little bit iffy at any stage. Please do bear with us. We'd like to welcome you to our podcast, Multiple Sclerosis Breaking It Down. And this series, It's All In Your Head, which focuses on the topic of mental health and MS. And why this topic? Well, here at the MS Trust, we get a lot of questions on the topic of mood, uh, depression, anxiety, and a bunch of other things that belong under the the mental health umbrella. And I think in MS, we're getting quite good at understanding and recognising and treating the physical symptoms we might have, um, things like spasticity and pain, uh, vision problems or bladder and bowel issues. But I think we're not quite as good at making sure that our mind gets the same care. Yes, but through this podcast, we want to change that. Uh, We want to normalise the conversation around mental health and get people talking. This episode is focusing on the topic of loneliness and mental health. Um, During lockdown, a lot of people have been feeling lonely and it can really play play a big toll on your mental health. Claire, you work in the inquiry service. Is this something that's come up as a topic in the calls and emails that you receive? We do get some calls in the inquiry service that are directly about mental health issues like depression or um, mood problems or feelings in in general. But I think we also see that dealing with MS in a more general sense leads to a knock-on effect on mental health as well. And I think uh, getting a little bit of support with mental health is something a lot of us could deal with, a lot of us could really use. Yeah, I think sometimes a lot of people talk about this online as well. Um, and, and people might feel a little bit ashamed to to speak up, especially, I mean, people can talk about things like depression and anxiety, but the whole thing about just saying, you know what, I feel really lonely. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a strange, because I think we all feel it at times, even when we have people in the house, you can still feel alone. It's been, a pre- that aspect of mental health has been pretty dramatic this year hasn't it we've all been forced to spend more time at home um, less time with um, people that live outside of our household and for those people that do live alone or with just one other person it must have been really really tough Um, now there will be some people who have thrived like that and there'll be some people who have been living like that for years as well and so perhaps this moment um, with the pandemic is a really good time to shine a bit of a light on that. Okay, you know, you've had this for a year. Well, think about someone who's been living like this for a decade or more. Um, What can we do to make sure there's really good support for people who are struggling with their mental health, who are finding it difficult to reach out to others? And on the flip side, maybe there's some positives. Um, Zoom calls and video conferencing and quizzes and things. There's... um, there's more opportunity than ever before to meet people in the virtual world, even if we can't meet them face to face. And just those little human interactions can make a big difference to someone's day. Absolutely. And I think, you know, talking about it, we have gotten a bit better at it. I I would like to think during the whole process of recording this um, podcast series. Um, But I, I do feel like, you know, as a, as a people living in the UK, we're often that kind of, Oh, shouldn't speak up you know mustn't grumble let's get on with things um but this is the third lockdown we're in now and it's it's getting a bit much (laughs) absolutely there's that stoic um sense of just you know getting on keep calm and carry on thing that we do tend to pride ourselves on in britain um but you know what a third lockdown after the year we've had the first one i think people might have found it a little bit of a novelty um and but after the after the third one and after a whole year of restrictions on our on our movements and our interactions it's going to have been hitting more and more people and quite hard so i actually had a chat with catherine from the mental health foundation on the topic of uh, mental health and loneliness and and what might people have been experiencing during lockdown and some things to think about as we come out of it again as well because for all the people that are looking forward to rushing off and sitting in pub gardens and meeting friends for picnics and all the rest of it there will be people who are still left behind there will be people who do not get the opportunity to get out Uh, maybe their mobility or their independence is limited they might not have people that they can easily call on to go and meet as well so i think i want to you know, raise that note of caution. There might still be people struggling out there. 
and what and I think Catherine had some lovely thoughts about things that we can all do to help ourselves and help each other. Let's have a listen. My name's Kathleen Seymour and I'm Head of Research at the Mental Health Foundation. And the way that I I think about research is, is quite simple really. Research is about finding things out and telling people. It's my job to find out what steps we can take as individuals and what actions we need to take as a society to look after our mental health as best we can, um, to minimise the risks that affect our mental health, but also to to know as much as we can about what makes our mental health better and find ways to prioritise that. And with the help of my amazing colleagues at the Mental Health Foundation, we find ways of then getting these messages to the right people, whether that is us as individuals or the messages that need to go to the government, businesses or workplace about changes that we ha- then we have evidence to show that making those changes will benefit the mental health of everyone. And we're, a, we're an organisation that focuses very much on prevention and a public health approach to mental health. So we're not particularly interested in whether or not someone has a diagnosis of a mental health condition. We're here for everybody. We believe that everybody has mental health and we're all somewhere on that spectrum, whether that's good, bad or somewhere in the middle. And what we want to do is make sure that everybody has the very best mental health that they can do as an individual. That sounds wonderful. Um, Have you been working at the Mental Health Foundation for very long? No, not long at all, really. I joined last April. I joined in April 2020, which um, was something like the third week of lockdown. Wow. So (laughs) (laughs) it's a very memorable way of joining um, an organisation, starting a new job. I was lucky enough that um, during the sort of the, the slight respite in lockdown regulations um, I because I cycle I was able to cycle to various parks in London and have one-to-one socially distanced meetings with members of my team so I've met most of the people I work with immediately but most of the people I talk to every day at work I have not met in person I've no idea how tall they are uh, what kind of shoes they wear um, yeah, what their handwriting looks like when they drink tea or coffee. It's it's quite a strange way of working. Isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? We have a few new starters at the MS Trust and we I go we're really looking forward to meeting them in person um eventually. Mm. Um but I think lockdown and I mean it's been a crazy year. Lockdown has provided a lot of challenges to people in terms of mental health. Um have you been doing any research on that at all? We have. So we have been um we started a survey a national survey from march of last year so we started it shortly before lockdown and we have we're now on about wave 10 of that of that survey so a little we've been running it a little bit more frequently than monthly to understand how our mental health has been affected by the pandemic and and affected by all the measures taken primarily to safeguard our physical health and we more recently we in the summer we started a similar survey but focusing on teenagers so our main survey looks at people aged 18 and over uh, across the four nations uh, all ages and then we have a, a, a survey with slightly different questions in looking at, uh, at teenagers and we did we did that second study because we realized that teenagers had experienced quite a particular um, particular impacts during the pandemic and they'd had a bit of a uh, sort of triple whammy, I suppose, of the effects of schools being being closed for for many people for a really long time, and feeling quite adrift from their community and their and their purpose. We teenagers have also been impacted because they 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 have suffered from a lack of contact with friends, and we all have, of course, but um, but for teenagers particularly, friendships are so important, and it's a very critical time in their lives when they're shifting from the primary relationship being with their family to actually getting support more from friendships so the fact that they haven't been to see friends has been um, a significant uh, difficulty for them and then and then the third part of that triple whammy is there's there's been a lot of blame levied on young people for yes. spreading um spreading the virus for not following um the restrictions in place and whilst 
I think a lot of that is um, it's, 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 it's just not a fair reflection. It's also been a particularly difficult time for young people who are not really affected by the virus. Um, and by following the restrictions, they're significantly affecting their own lives. So actually where young people do strictly follow the, the rules and regulations, then they're, they're making a, a significant sacrifice and rather than, than blame those people actually um, you know, thanking them for, for, the, for the contribution that they have made is more effective. So th those are some of the reasons we decided yeah. that, that we needed to have that separate teenage focus. Absolutely. Have you looked very much at um, people with other health conditions um, and uh, for example, like multiple sclerosis and, and dealing with the lockdown? So one of the, one of the questions we ask in our survey is we ask, if um, the person responding has a pre-existing mental or physical condition, we don't we don't ask what that is, um, but we but we wanted to to see whether people who already um, were were managing a, a long-term condition in their lives were going to be affected in different ways by the pandemic. And what we've seen is that um, whilst we, we see large parts of the population. Their, their emotions and feelings and mental health being negatively impacted. We see people with a pre-existing condition as being particularly severely impacted, whether that's loneliness, worry and anxiety um, or, or, or their feelings about the future. Uh, we, they, along with a couple of other, other population groups, people with a pre-existing condition do seem to have, um, have had more to deal with, and that's taken more of an emotion, emotional toll on them during the pandemic. I think we've heard a lot in our inquiry service from people with, with MS who have felt that there's a lot of the talk, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic, was about the, almost devaluing their lives because they had a pre-existing pre condition, that somehow it was going to be OK if they died or were very severely ill because most people wouldn't be affected. And so, I mean... It, that was really complicated, I think, for people. Mm, yes, yeah, so I, I, I saw um, I saw a, a a really quite chilling um, comment about this recently in a news article that pre-existing conditions have been just 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 battered away, not taken seriously, and that um, if we if we don't if we don't think about pre-existing conditions as, as mattering, then you could say, well. Um, Harold Shipman didn't actually. Harold Shipman didn't actually kill anybody, because everybody um, who was a victim of Harold Shipman had um, had a long term condition, had a pre existing condition. So we we don't think about it that way. We did think that um, that you know, Harold Shipman um, was responsible for those people's deaths, and but we somehow we're not thinking about the virus in in, in quite the same way. Uh, and once you put those two together, it, it does it does suggest that we. For whatever reason, are not taking not taking it seriously when um, some people who have uh, who are living with other conditions are, are are at greater risk than others. And as a result, they're they're more, as you say, they're they're scared, they're anxious um, that the pandemic reflected more risk to them than to other people, as well as having that stigma um, coming from society more generally. It's not really surprising, is it, that people were um, experiencing more health and um, more mental health problems over the last year. Um, is that something that you've seen in your in your data? Yes, so we, we've seen in our data that um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw significant increases in um, rates of, of, of worry, anxiety, fear and loneliness. We saw quite a sharp increase, actually, when lockdown measures came in in March of 2020. And that may be because of the, the impact of um, the lockdown measures, or it may simply have been a point of realisation for people that actually, um, OK, this is something really serious. I, and, and the fear may have been more to do with the virus than to do with the lockdown measures. But, um, but, but there's a number of things playing through at that point. Sure. Sure. We saw some of those those those, um, those feelings and those impacts very very gradually start to tail off as lockdown measures eased. So as as we got into the summer, levels of loneliness and anxiety started to go down slightly, or still remaining higher than the sort of baseline point they'd been in early March. 
but then mm-hmm. since the since early autumn they have been rising again and rising quite quite significantly so it seems to follow the patterns of um both the um sort of what's happening with the virus and also what's happening with the measures to to control the virus i think that um for younger people in particular we've seen loneliness really increase since um since the the early autumn and a lot of that is about full-time students who um have been unable to to actually to to mix and to socialize and have been away at university or college but unable to um to really leave 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 where they're living so as if as if they are um uh, as if they are shielded. They're sort of stuck in limbo, aren't they? Mm, definitely, yeah. definitely. But the, I, th- I think what's really interesting about loneliness in particular is that there's quite a lot of, of subtlety to that. So mm. there's a very perhaps intuitive example of somebody who's lonely, which would be somebody who is older or someone who's living alone and perhaps shielding. So just not getting out and about, not um, not taking part in activities, not able to go and see friends and family and and there's certainly um, a number of people who do fit within that example but um, there are are, are other people who are lonely that we might might overlook and that can mean people who are are living with others but um, but still feel lonely and and it's important to remember that we don't need to be alone to feel lonely actually loneliness has got a lot to do with do you feel a connection with the people you're around do you feel that they they get you do they understand you do they uh, accept you for who you are so we've seen a lot of, we've actually seen very high rates of loneliness amongst people who are living um in shared occupancy houses oh of course yeah and and then particularly maybe relevant for some of your listeners is carers and those who have caring responsibilities or usually even pre-pandemic would show higher rates of loneliness than um, than people who don't have caring responsibilities, but since the pandemic, that has that that has really sharpened because um, without having um, opportunities for, for respite and being able to um, to go and have a break, then um, that's been that's been very tough for people who um, need to be caring for somebody else. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Without that, without that. Um without being able to have a little bit of a break mm. um, it's been it's been it's been a really long time and and mm. that's the worry with loneliness that once uh loneliness really starts to set in it can be very difficult to get out of that and for some people when when things start to go back to normal after the after, after lockdown measures um are, are eased some people will will be able to shake that feeling of loneliness um particularly if they've got friends and family that they are waiting to see but for other people who have spent a long time by themselves or perhaps their normal um, normal ways of, of interacting with others have just have dropped off to the extent that it's hard to restart those. It can be really difficult to um, to come back from loneliness. And lo- it's, loneliness, it's, it's, we know, is, is really bad for both our physical and mental health. We, we, there's evidence now that shows it's the equivalent of smoking 10 cigarettes a day. So loneliness is, is not a sort of a temporary blip. Loneliness is something that has to be taken seriously. We are nearly a month into what is the third lockdown for most people in Britain. Um, what do you think is different about this lockdown, Catherine, compared to the previous ones that we've gone through in various parts of the UK? Well, I, I think the thing that's, that's most immediately striking is the time of year. And during lockdown, there isn't much we can do um, generally, but also much we can do to help our mental health um, beyond going for walks outside. Um, and, and that's obviously much more difficult in winter because um, you know, the days are shorter and the weather is less, less enticing. Um, and, and it's not really, you know, spending time outside, you have to keep moving. There's no sort of sitting, sitting and enjoying being outside. You need to keep, keep moving to keep warm. So I think winter, this lockdown being winter definitely does um, make a big difference and um, for those people who are lucky enough to have green spaces nearby uh, it's a great thing to make use of those but for but for many people actually you know they don't, they're not within easy reach of some pleasant green space to spend time in so that you know that that does make things that does make things much harder 
think also the fact that this is the third lockdown and I don't I think we probably saw it coming a little bit before but this is not what we anticipated a year ago or even six months ago we thought we were we were done with lockdowns and we were um, going to see easing of restrictions rather than than tightening and for many people who um, have not only had to lock down but also had to to shield um, or, or to 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 behave as if it's been a, a lockdown all the way through this is nearly a year now since grandparents have been able to spend time with with grandchildren families have been able to come together people have been able to to hug and have physical contact with with others so this is a really long time and it's not just more of the same there is a cumulative effect the longer the longer this goes on the, the, the harder it is to bear uh, and although we do have we do have the vaccine now and we, we can see that that is being rolled out to those who are most vulnerable that's going to take a little bit of time uh, and I think a few months ago we we had so much hope in the vaccine um, and, and didn't perhaps fully appreciate how long it would take mm -hmm. for the vaccine to take effect um, and and you know and, and and doing that at the same time as all our health and social care staff are super super busy um, treating those who are sick with COVID um, so it's it, you know it's, it's 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 a really big ask of our healthcare workers to 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 cope with those who are are are, are sick and are ill and in hospital and need care and also mm -hmm. get this vaccine rolled out to as many people as possible. And then I think that the, the third part of the puzzle is that in this lockdown, schools are closed. So the second lockdown, um, everything, all, all the measures were the same, except that that schools remained open and schools being closed has a massive impact on the mental health of children, teenagers and, and their parents and families, for, for, for sure. And we know that um, that children have really suffered with schools being closed, not not just educationally, but um, but for children, school school can be a whole world. School is your community. School is where you get your sense of purpose. You have your role models there, and your teachers and your peers and, and, and older children. You have a feedback loop. You have you have um, uh, you have people giving you reassurance that you're, you're you're setting goals and you're meeting goals. School does all of that. It also, for many children, acts as a, a safeguarding. Um, element and mm -hmm. children who are seen uh, and observed by teachers every day those teachers know when something's not right and those children know those those, those teachers know when to um, yeah. to raise concerns and it, that's just so much harder to do on on a screen and yeah. uh, and, and many children are, are home homeschooling now but with some contact in terms of live live online sessions from schools, but not all children. Many many schools are not providing that live um, teacher contact time. So you know that that is definitely a factor in this third lockdown. That school all schools are closed, um, and and that's a stress for families at home who are trying to balance homeschooling and working at the same time. Yes, of course, and of course for some children, is this year represents a really high proportion of their lifespan. You know. You know, those of us who've, who are adults and have seen a few summers can remember them. Um, but when you're only, when your memory is quite short and you don't have much to, to, to balance it against, I can imagine that feeling that this is the new normal now must be mm. quite, quite overwhelming for them. Yeah, and of I, course, I, go on. I, I think about my, um, my nephew who's two and a half and now for a full year he, hasn't had contact with anyone other than than his parents um and that yeah that makes a big difference in terms of, of development and i you know i'm i'm sure that 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 he will catch up but for many children actually that catching up is going to take a long time um and for children who are are most vulnerable uh, and are most disadvantaged they, they may not catch up because they don't have that um, immediate ability mm. for everything to switch back on again. The the um, the impacts of this of this lockdown, particularly for those um, those in the country who are are poorest, are going to go on a long time because um, we won't return to the same economic situation that we were before. People there will still be high rates of of, of unemployment for some time um, onwards. So, you know, we we're all feeling very. We're all really feeling the the impacts to our mental health and well-being of this lockdown. Hope when 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 lockdown finishes and things do start to get normal, many of us will bounce back 
but then there's also a proportion of people who um for whom it won't be that easy because they won't uh, they won't be going back to the situation they were in um and and things are going to take a long time to recover for them well i think forewarned is forearmed isn't it to some extent you know recognizing this is a big part of being able to deal with it so even once lockdown is over understanding that there's a journey to be made for a lot of people that they're going to continue to need support to get um to get themselves back on track um whether that's people with ms or young families or or any combination um are there any things you think that we could be putting in place now to give ourselves a bit of protection and resilience well i think maintaining as good well as good well-being as you can right now is really important so it's great it's 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 really great to have this goal in the future of when things are going to return to normal but we don't we don't know when that is and we don't know how quickly that will happen and um and and, and how quickly that will happen for us personally so you know a, the best preventative strategy is to to do what you can right now and one of the things we asked about in our in our survey is we asked people what coping strategies they have found the most effective and um people named things like um learning a new hobby stay in contact with friends, um, stay in contact with family, spending time outdoors. Across every age group, apart from teenagers, the um, the most popular coping strategy was spending time outside, going for walks, spending time in nature. Uh, for teenagers, it was actually spending time and, and being in contact with friends, which I think is a really interesting and, and valuable insight into how important friends are at that at that um that age where we are creating more independence for ourselves becoming more independent of our of our family and um and, and putting more more value on friendships so thinking about how much spending time in nature helps us helps us cope with the stresses and the worries of the pandemic this is something to to really try and prioritize if it if it means you have to restructure your day so that you get to spend some time outdoors when it's when it's light, um, then then try and do that. The, 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 the best thing is to to really reflect on what's your coping strategy. What are the things that help you help lift your mood? What are the things that you look forward to each day? And then thinking about what you can change about your day to prioritize that. Can you can you change the pattern that you work? Can you change? Um, can you shift? meal times um, or activities with with your family to be able to to prioritize the thing that makes makes your boosts your mood and that might be spending time outdoors for a lot of people it is it might not be it might be a bit of time alone it might be a a phone call with um with a friend or relative but w- w- whatever it is identify what your own coping mechanism mechanisms are and um and really p- try and prioritize them if if you don't know where to start then Spending time outdoors is, is is almost a universal coping strategy, and there's some really good good reasons for this. Spending time outdoors, particularly in the light, helps to regulate our circadian rhythms, so that helps us sleep better. And we all we all know when we've had a good night's sleep, we feel better and and, and more capable the next day. Connecting with nature also calms us and reduces stress. It also interestingly helps us to feel less lonely. Partly because if we go outside, we're more likely to have contact with another person. And, and you know, in, in COVID times, that needs to be safe contact. But we are more likely to to have have contact. Even if it's just um, waving to a dog walker, you know, it's, exactly. it's, an, it's evidence that there's other people out there, isn't it? Exactly. And, and, that, and that actually everybody is, 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 is going through a similar situation. So, you know, you're, you are much more likely to make contact with other people outside than you are if you stay inside. And it also helps us to feel connected to the place that we live in and it gives us a sense of community. So ideally, this is time spent outside, but in nature. But even if it's not spent in nature, walking around the residential streets where you live still helps you feel like you have a place in that local community. And feeling connected is is a really great way of um, of, of, of counteracting the sense of loneliness. That's, that's really lovely. Um, I think a lot of people... Uh, listening to this might actually find that they are more restricted to the home than they would like they might require carers to get them out and about or have mean they would 
be anxious about going out on their own or if the road if the paths are icy that kind of thing mm. so where that's not possible um you've talked about hobbies and 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 finding other other kinds of coping strategies um and it, it, can you think of anything else that might be useful for people who can't get out as much as they might like to well firstly on the nature point if you if you if you if it's difficult to get out in nature regularly then think about ways of bringing nature to you so pot plants indoors um you know that, that that's nature and that can really that can have the same effect in smaller doses but still an important effect of helping us feel calmer and feel less stressed um sitting sitting near a window um working out which which windows you get light in at different times of the day and, and, and prioritizing being close to those windows ha- having having a nice having a nice view whether that means that you you need to um if you can put some plants outside or just 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 think about what you like where you like where you get a benefit of looking out of the window from mm. and um and, and and setting up a nice seating area so that you you actually want to to sit yeah. by that window and 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 have as well as simply the looking at nature there's the perspective as well and being able to look far into the distance Mm -hmm. is something it's very difficult to do if you're just in the house your your vision is 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 just quite quite limited so just finding somewhere where you can actually look into the distance that can really help to have a calming effect as well but thinking about um what else we can do beyond beyond ways of of involving nature in our in our, our lives and our homes one um one thing we really like to recommend at the Mental Health Foundation is kindness as um, as something that uh, is a great coping strategy, but also is a really good antidote to to loneliness. And kindness is um, is this this really quite powerful tool, um, and and often feels is often a kind of untapped resource that we all have. Doing good does you good when we perform a kind act we're thinking about the other person. So that creates a connection. It also boosts our, our self-esteem and our feelings of power. Mm-hmm. If you're powerful enough to influence someone, else, someone else's emotions positively in this case, that can make you feel like you're, you actually have some power, you have some control. And that you know, feeling, feeling in charge of something and feeling powerful is a huge mood booster. And it also helps to, to put things in perspective by helping someone who is not as fortunate as you, helps us to have a more positive outlook on our own circumstances. And we don't need to identify somebody who is, who we think is particularly unfortunate. Maybe they're just not as fortunate as you in some, in one aspect, you know, maybe. Or maybe not even just are... today, you know, some, isn't it? It's, yes. Sometimes it's just recognising that today is not a good day for that person and doing what you can. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's really powerful. Exactly. Maybe, you know, maybe that person would really appreciate a, um, a phone call or you know maybe that person isn't great at baking so can you bake them some bread and and drop it round to them um can you you it's the little touches that make all the difference Mm. so if you want to if you want to let someone know that you're thinking of them an email is nice a text is nice but actually a handwritten note is so much better Mm. it's it's nice to receive but it also shows that you have spent the time thinking about um and putting putting extra effort in and the same with a phone call you know make make a call to somebody but try not to squeeze it in whilst you're doing something else think about how you can give that person your undivided attention actually set aside some time to sit and then you'll find you're listening to them more Mm. and listening to someone and giving them your attention is such a huge gift and it's something that we we don't really do as much as we Mm. as, as 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 we used to because we lead busy lives or we think other people lead busy lives but setting aside some time to to really listen to somebody uh and to ask them how they are that um that's a huge act of kindness that sounds wonderful um yeah and that's something that anyone can do isn't it absolutely anyone anyone can do it um at any time and and it becomes this lovely virtuous circle because if you're kind to somebody it usually leads to a reciprocal act Mm -hmm. and more more kind act so you're starting um a really lovely chain of events and, and when thinking about doing kind things, remember to be kind to yourself. And all these things that you you're, you think, I want to do this for another person because they're having a hard time and they deserve it. You're also having a hard time and, and you deserve kindness. So, you know, if you make a mistake, if you forget something, if you're late for something, don't beat yourself up. 
treat treat yourself the same way you would your best friend and and and, and be kind and just let yourself think okay yeah I made a mistake we all make mistakes that's okay I won't do it next time so kindness is 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 great it's a great habit to pass on to other people yeah it's a great habit it is, to get it into. Is. and don't don't forget yourself and if you're kind to yourself then you you set yourself some standards for how you want other people to um to to to, to act with you as well um and and and, and can really help to create a, a higher level of self-esteem that sounds like really useful advice that anyone can put into action thank you so much are there um are there what, what about if it's got really bad um if if it's gone beyond feeling low if if your mental health has has you know if you've been feeling unusually sad for a long time you're finding it difficult to be interested in things or rouse yourself to new to new new things um at the point where you might think that I, I, i've got a bit more of a problem here and i need something extra or somebody's extra input what's what's the first steps for somebody who feels who feels like that so if you if you feel like that, or even if you you don't feel like that yet, but you're worried you might, mm-hmm. um, I would really recommend taking a look at our website, mentalhealth.org.uk. We have lots of guidance and advice for anyone who's experiencing difficult times with their mental health. We also have specific guidance for um, for mental health um, during the pandemic. So we have we have guidance for um, for parenting during the pandemic. Um, for anyone who's who's coping with a, a bereavement as a result of um, of COVID, and 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 some guides uh, for for coping during the winter as well. Mm-hmm. So do do have a look at our, our guidance and advice, and that can be a really useful first step. Think about how you can um, ask for help from family or friends. So you know, family and friends can provide such amazing informal support, but you but it often requires a first step you re- you need to reach out to somebody open up and talk in- encourage people to do the same with you as well so that you you've established that um you know that that sort of relationship that you can talk to one another um but reaching out to family and friends when you need help is um is, is also a great first step if if you don't feel you have anyone to to turn to and you feel like um things are very difficult then contact your gp if you have difficulty contacting your GP, um, that because waiting times are, are are long and are are affected by what's going on with the pandemic, then um, then think about a, a helpline. So Samaritans are um, are open twenty four hours a day and are there for anybody, no matter what what distress you're going through and what level of distress it is. There is no there is no sort of um, cut off for how severe. Uh, or, 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 or not that 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 is. They're there for everybody. So that the most important thing is don't suffer in silence. If you you feel that you you can't resolve um, some of the problems yourselves you, you, yourself, then 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 reach out whether it's to family or friends, or to your GP, or to a helpline like Samaritans. Thank you. I'm sure that's really good advice. Do you have any sort of final thoughts, then, Catherine? I'm, I'm aware we've had so much of your your time and your great advice here do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share for people who are living with a long-term condition and looking you know looking ahead at 2021 and thinking how are we going to how are we going to get through this I think I think now is a is a particularly hard time it is it's winter uh, it's it's lockdown and it's this situation has been going on for a year and it's really easy to to lose hope because right now it's it, it, it is a very dark time but there is there is a vaccine uh, and that vaccine is being rolled out and we should start to see the the effect of that soon so it's about holding on holding on to that hope and thinking about that that this this time will pass and something i i i try and hold on to when i'm feeling that that um this is just going on forever and, and will things ever change is I, I think about the fact that um, every day the sun rises a minute or two earlier and it sets a minute or two later. And no matter what happens, that will happen. The days will get longer. We'll get more light. The weather will get better. And that's, you know, that, that's a certainty. And I think right now when there are so few certainties going on, it can really 
help to hold on to a, to to one certainty in life. Oh, thank you. Yes, you're absolutely right. That little bit extra, extra sunlight each day, just uh, yeah, yeah. It, it certainly makes a difference to my mood. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been lovely to talk to you, and um, I'm oh, sure thank you so much for having me. So many really powerful things that you've said today that have really resonated, and I'm sure people will find really useful. Now, if this was a commercial podcast, here is where there would be an advert. But as we're a charity, we don't do that. So instead, we'd like to take the opportunity to tell you about our fantastic resources that we have for people with MS. So that's right. Our website, mstrust.org.uk, has tons of information and resources for people affected by MS, whether that's you yourself or a friend or family member. And we have a section on the website that is totally devoted to well-being and MS. Um, That has sections on living well with MS, taking charge of your MS, MS and your emotions, uh, practical tips to deal with things like depression and anxiety. Um, So we tackle sort of the heavy subjects, but also uh, tries to focus on some of the positive things. That's mstrust.org.uk forward slash well-being. Um, right, we are back. Um, I really enjoyed your chat with Catherine. I thought that was very interesting. Um, there's a few things that I picked up on um, that I know that I'm guilty of. You know how people always kind of talk about the teenagers being the ones that are breaking the rules and going out and and, and doing naughty things. Um, but all the teenagers that don't and how they get uh, feeling very guilty uh, just because people are saying that um, they they're the ones that break the rules, but loads of people are not breaking the rules. Um, and and um, it made me feel a bit like, oh, I should I should be good at not saying things like that. Um, the other things that I really liked was things like um, um, just, you know, waving to a dog walk. <laughs> you know, it's those moments of just little human interaction that make all the difference. It reminds you that there are people out there. And once this is all over, we can get back out to see them again. Um, I like going into the bank and talking to a cashier if I rather than just using the hole in the wall sometimes for that same reason um but yeah I think getting out and about you do see other people and realize that I've loved the fact that our local park has been much busier than normal now on the one hand people get anxious about getting too close to each other but I just love to see that that outdoor resource being used and seeing so many people just getting out for what once you know a walk around the block and just getting some fresh air and seeing people. Yeah, and I thought it was very interesting that she said that the report was that a lot of people have been doing that, trying to get out to nature, apart from maybe teenagers um, who have been sort of keeping in touch with their friends in, in different ways. Um, well, it's been tough to be young. Yeah, it really has. And I, 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 you're absolutely right. A lot of teenagers get, uh, they hear the negative comments, um, but like, as with all things, it's a small minority and the vast majority of people are sticking to the rules. And that includes teenagers, too. Yeah, there was even an article in the BMJ about the fact that most people are sticking to the rules, even if they get pointed out that a lot of people are, are breaking it. But those are the only people you see. You don't see all the yeah, ones sticking but, you to know, one, one or two news articles about one or two parties, you know, that's you know, that's kind of inevitable. And it's a tiny fraction. You know, the vast majority of people in Britain are listening to the listening to the advice and taking care of themselves and others and one thing that i liked you know for people who can't maybe get out and do things it was the idea of uh, getting some pot plants into your house that's something i did you know, during lockdown my husband thought i was going crazy with buying plants and <laughs> filling, filling the living room with them but i, I find it it's a little bit an, a, of an oasis, oasis of just kind of <sighs> Absolutely. Get nature inside with you if you can't get outside to nature. Yeah. And the days are getting lighter. So and we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is, um, well, I just hope that this is all going to carry on moving forward. And it could be a year full of positives now, I think. Yes. Um, and Fingers. being grateful for the little things that we will soon be able to have, have back in our lives again. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I think it's important to understand that you're not alone if you're having trouble with your mental health. A lot of people with MS are in a similar position to you and there's absolutely no shame or stigma in reaching out for some help. 
And also remember that if you have any questions about MF, we are here for you. The inquiry service is available from Monday to Friday, except bank holidays, from nine till five. Outside those hours, you can leave us a message and we'll, or an email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Instagram. And you can find this podcast on Spotify, Google and Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music. Uh, we would love it if you give us a follow, you know, rave about us, tell everybody about us because um, we want to reach you, you and um, your friends and everyone who would want to have a listen. Um, so get in touch and like they say, uh, like and subscribe. Thank you for talking to us today, Claire. Bye-bye then, Helena. Bye-bye.